What's up YouTube and welcome back to another video. Today I'm going to talk about something that will definitely be of interest to some of you. I'm going to talk about what makes a good doctor from the patient's point of view. Today is day, let's think, 15, 16, 17, 18, day 19. I think I started to lose my hair actually from about two, about two days ago. It's really weird feeling. I was washing my hair and it's just bits of hair keep falling out. Every time I touch my hair it's like... So like while I'm eating, I'll just be eating and then look down and there's just hair everywhere. Interesting experience, um, but you know, we'll see what happens. I'll keep you guys updated as to how my beautiful anime hair changes. Reel it back in, back to the main point of the video. What makes a good doctor? First disclaimer, all of the things that I'm about to say is all from my own personal point of view of how I think all the doctors and different nurses and healthcare professionals have handled meeting me and talking to me. Number one, as a GP, what do you need to do? You need to make the person feel cared about. So this time when I went, I went and I said, I found this huge lump on my neck. It's a bit weird, what do you think? Um, and he said, this is strange, it could just be an infection, but it could be something weirder. So let's get some blood tests going, come back in two weeks if it's weird. And this was good. He told me what I should be doing. He suggested things that I should be doing. He suggested possibilities. He was never like, you know, this is horrible, but he was also not like, ah, oh, this is nothing. Now compare this to a terrible doctor that I had once. I was like, oh look, I've got this and this is funny. And, and the doctor was literally like, mm, I'm gonna say it's probably nothing. And my recommendation and my advice to you is to not look at it. Like what? Don't look at it, ignore it's there. As a doctor, you want to make sure that the patient feels like they're cared about. Now, I understand that this may be difficult sometimes because I know a lot of people can over-exaggerate their issues. For example, and action. Doctor, please, I need help. Explain. So I've got like a, a sniffly nose and, and I'm sneezing and I'm coughing and <laughs> I feel horrible. I think you have a cold. But please, I need you to give me drugs or something so I can get over this quickly. <laughs> no, I think you're fine as it is. Please. My auntie Kim, she had a sniffly nose and she, she was all sneezing and coughing and then she went to the GP and they said it's nothing and didn't give her any antibiotics and then the next day she died. What did she have? I mean, it was a car accident, but the point is, I could die tomorrow. <laughs> now you do get some weird people like that. Generally speaking, you want to make sure that the patient doesn't feel like they're just being shoved to the side and ignored. Now the second time I went to the GP, it was a slightly different situation and they said, you know, this is quite weird I and mean, you have a huge lump on your neck. Get a tape measure out, five centimeters. And the important thing that I learned here was clarity. Clarity is super important. Not just giving me weird like words and being like, mm, it's strange. I recommend that you are referred to a special, it was a very much a, you aren't showing signs of, you know, you're not sneezing, you're not dribbly, you're not leaking things everywhere. <laughs> you know, you don't have obvious signs of infection which makes this weirder because you had this huge lump on your neck and no other symptoms. So I'm going to refer you urgently to um, a specialist. And he was very clear, he said this is an urgent referral. Number three, when I was referred to the specialist consultant, the hematologist, one of the things that he was very good at from the off was creating a feeling of unity. So making me feel calm, secure, safe to share and to talk to the doctor. And he made it feel like this wasn't just me, in this issue, in this problem. It felt like we were a team and that he was going to help me find the solution to this issue. At no point was it a, I'm leading you or I'm diagnosing you as a patient. It was a, let's see what we can do here and let's make sure that this isn't something horrible or let's make sure that we find out what the root of the problem is. The general feeling that we're all in this together. The number four, open and honest communication. So. Keeping the patient updated and constantly in the loop was something that I felt as the patient on the receiving end, something very useful or helpful to, especially my, um, my steps of coming to acceptance of what this may be. A great thing about the UK is that, I'm not sure whether it's everywhere, but letters of referral and emails being sent between um, one consultant to the other, from the GP to the specialist. And whenever these referral letters go out, a copy of it comes to my house so I can see what the doctor's written and I can see, you know, when he says um, this patient has, you know, a risk of infertility or this patient has a probable diagnosis of Hodgkin's lymphoma. 
Now this honesty and this openness can be a bit difficult because I know a, a few of the doctors that I met along the way, for example, during my fine needle um, aspiration, when I asked them, you know, what do you think you're leaning towards? Because you've obviously seen loads of these before. They would try and be conservative and not give me any worries by saying, you know, it could just be an infection, but it could be something weirder. But when I asked my specialist, I really appreciate it. I said, what, do, what are you leaning towards? And he said, you know, I am leaning towards some kind of lymphoma, but we can't be sure. And honestly, I appreciated this so much. Now, this is a very much a personal choice, so be very careful with this part. But I'd rather take a bit of worry and a bit of doubt than complete reassurance. In this two month process of me preparing to find out that I had cancer, it was really important that I was able to build myself up for the final outcome. I'd rather have some level of doubt or worry, you know, just like a smidgen of, you may have cancer, you may not. And then comes when you come to deliver the news. And one of the important parts here was to be prepared. Scouts on that. Always be prepared. When I came and I sat down with my mum, she sat me down and said, we found the problem. Do you have what we, you know, we were leaning towards? You have Hodgkin's lymphoma. And he had so much prepared. He had uh, packs, he had books, he had things. He sat us down and he said, you know, these are your results. And here's a book. This is gonna outline what we're gonna do. He was so organized and prepared and this helped sort of keep everything down to earth, I guess so that we weren't just kind of all over the place. He brought in the chemo nurse that would be, you know, looking after me, well, one of the nurses. And she talked me through everything as well. They constantly said, you know, do I have any questions? Do I have anything to ask? They were just so prepared with all the information that I could possibly need in that amount of time. You know, what do I need to do? How much time do I have to take off work? And what are the complications? This sort of stuff. Now this next point is probably the most important one that I've felt from all of my treatment so far. Be personal. Don't fall into the trap of, I'm a doctor, you're a patient, you're a client, you know, I'm just here to get you fixed enough. This is especially for other members of staff as well, especially nurses, um, because I see them the most. But being just human, you know, it's not, it's not hard, technically speaking, you know, we're all innately human, uh, but being human, and personal. Making sure that you treat us, not just as a patient that you need to fix, but as a person, almost familial in a sense, is amazing. Like first day into chemo, boom, they've got my name sorted. Um, they say, gun, hi, this is gonna be the process. I start with a smile. Whenever I phone them up, the nurses always pick up and they answer with a happy tone. Like after interacting with all these nurses, a part of me is like, I wanna marry a nurse. <laughs> It's, it's little things like knowing your patient's name, recognizing your patient. When you bump into your patient being like, oh, hi, how are you doing? Talking to a patient, not like a patient, but just as a human being, providing some sort of normal conversation, greeting patients with a smile. Obviously, I think the medical part and the medical care aspect of treatment is super important, obviously. Or else, what's the point? But I think the hardest and probably the most important part is that patient-doctor interaction and how you handle the social side of medical treatment. Like the medi medically speaking, your body is gonna handle the drugs and go through everything. But the hardest part is the social and the life aspect of it. And, and this, how this affects your emotions, uh, your mood, and your daily atmosphere or environment. I am very positive and I don't, ah oh, crap, my hair. <laughs> now I am very positive and I do act like I'm fine but every time I go to my chemo you know the day before my chemo going into my chemo especially after my most recent one which was a little difficult I am scared I am nervous I mean I'm about, I'm about to have what two to three liters of um, chemotherapy drugs pumped into my body with saline and fighting a war inside my body you know and I don't feel great sometimes during it or after and I know that there are going to be complications so when it comes to providing a sense of security or a sense of uh, distraction or just a sense that I have support there in the people around me the faster we can create that relationship and that friendly atmosphere the easier it is to deal with the rest of the treatment and generally 
the entire chemo cancer experience. Now this one's the last and most important point, biscuits. Now we're talking like when I get in, then I sit down, you know, I'm waiting for that call when they come up to you and say, would you like some tea, coffee? I'm like, no, thank you. And they say, biscuits? I'm like, yes, please. And we're talking like chocolate bourbons, the jam filled sort of jammy dodger style ones. We're talking uh, custard cream, shortbread, like ginger snaps, everything, just biscuits. Uh, but yeah, this is one, it's one of the things that helped me get through a day of chemo. Okay, hopefully that wasn't too long. Again, this is probably not going to be for everybody, but for those of you who want to be medics or who want to know what it's like uh, for a patient to interact with a doctor, I hope this was helpful. Shout out to that medic and the medic life. I know they're inspiring loads of people, so I hope this can help them to further inspire other people and help them in the steps towards becoming a doctor. Again, final disclaimer, take all of this with a pinch of salt. You know, this is just from my experience. I'm not sure what the exact protocol is with, um, you know, doctor, healthcare, patient interaction. So as per usual, leave a like if you liked, leave a dislike if you disliked, uh, leave a comment if you have any feedback, and hit that subscribe button if you haven't already. Let's go challenges. There was one issue actually regarding clarity in that the doctor wasn't always clear on what I would be doing. He said I'd get a fine needle aspirin, I'd get a biopsy, I'd get a, a scan. There were about three or four times when I, you know what, this time next week I should know my final diagnosis. So fingers crossed. Fingers crossed. But then I'd go there, get the results back and it'd be the same thing. We don't know what's going on. So that was probably the, the, the biggest issue that I had with regarding clarity.